Disturbing music. When I started researching this topic a month ago, I really thought all I was gonna find was eerie and creepy soundscapes with a few disturbing music videos like Die Fantasy thrown into the mix. But I was pleasantly surprised to find some stuff that I honestly think is worse than some of the more intense topics and videos that I've gone over in my disturbing media series, including the Iceberg series. From people accidentally being crushed by pianos to bands almost killing their audience members during live performances to what you might expect, which is just eerie sounding noises. The disturbing music iceberg has you covered. Now this video is going to be a lot different than my other icebergs that I've done in the past. Usually when I do an iceberg video, I just find as much information as many topics and ideas on whatever we're going over. For example, on the disturbing website iceberg, I covered hundreds of websites in that video and I just tried to mash as many as possible into that two hour length. But on today's video, I tried my best to only include things that I felt either weren't covered well enough or have some kind of new piece of information that I found. So if you see something on the YouTube timeline as you're scrubbing through that you think you might know, I might have uncovered something new to it. So you might want to stick around for that. Right before we get into it, I have one honorable mention on today's video that you will see come up in one of the layers, but does not have its own dedicated segment. The evil music video. I'm not gonna lie, this one really bummed me out because I was hoping to pull together a really good story for you all. So uh, essentially what ended up happening is there was a music video by the band Interpol for their song Evil. And in my research, I found that a lot of people came up with this popular theory for the song and the music video that they were tied to the West killings, specifically Fred and Rose West. I personally did not buy it though. There was a lot of inconsistencies that I found as I started digging more into the lyrics, the music video, and just overall what was happening with this theory. I found a lot of problems with it and I started trying to string along my own story as to what it was about. And one of the ways I was going to confirm this story was by reaching out to someone that was involved with the music video. I tried contacting Charlie White, the director of the music video, to hopefully give some much needed insight on the project and see if he knew anything about the song and the tie to the killers. But this was to no avail. Please leave your message after the tone. When done, okay. hang up or press the pound key. Sorry, but the user's mailbox can't accept more messages. I have a lot of stories just like this one when researching a lot of my icebergs. So if you want to hear more just like it, I have a full playlist of 20 to 30 minute behind the scenes where I just take you through the research and any kind of crazy stories that happen along the way. If you end up enjoying today's video, feel free to support me on Patreon for access to all of that. It's only three bucks for the behind the scenes playlist, more frequent updates on videos and sneak peeks as I make progress on any big projects. Patreon members have been getting exclusive updates on a disturbing music iceberg as it was being made, as well as one day early access. So they've already seen this video that you're watching. Again, if you end up enjoying what I've made today and you want to support me, it's three bucks for all of that. And if you want to feel a little extra special and go for the biggest tier, you'll end up on screen like these people. This will bring me to the patron shout out. So if you are on screen, Thank you so much for supporting me these last two months as I was finishing this project up. Today is an exception because usually I put this at the end of the video and I'm still going to do that anyways, but I just wanted to give a little extra thanks because it's been awesome being able to just focus on my work and not worry so much about bills and whatnot. So thank you guys. I'm really hoping that everyone sees all the hard work I've been putting into this as nearly a two hour video that I've just done what just me and my little team that I have. Uh, it's literally one other person. And yeah, I, I am so excited for this video to get along. So <laughs> without further ado, let's get into layer one of the disturbing music iceberg. From strange musical instruments to ear piercing sounds to some incredibly odd music lore. This layer is mostly comprised of what you would expect from an iceberg about disturbing music. The Apprehension Engine 
When you hear the topic disturbing music, most of you probably expected something similar to this. The Apprehension Engine, an instrument dedicated to bringing you disturbing, horror-ridden sounds like this. This was developed by Mark Corvin, who had a very interesting, almost Sid from Toy Story-like approach to creating this instrument. The reason I say this is because this instrument is the amalgamation of all types of devices and sounds used to score horror movies, all put into one little machine. I guess little is not really the right word to describe this, but you might be pressed to ask, why would someone need such a device? The main use for this was to create musical scores for horror movies. Mark Corvin has scored many, many horror films, most notably The Witch in 2015. Sometime after The Witch was released, Mark expressed boredom with the sounds that he was producing, claiming that he was tired of digital sounds that could just be downloaded and clipped by anybody, and he wanted a tool or instrument that would be able to create these sounds organically. Determined to create something capable of what he wanted, Mark reached out to Tony Duggan Smith, a masterful instrument creator that Mark tasked with inventing the ultimate horror sound machine. A device that could replicate every sound known as horror, but in an all-in-one small compact box. And the apprehension engine is what came out of it. This thing looks like a Frankenstein mess at first glance. There's guitar handles stitched to the sides, differing sized metal rulers that are screwed onto the front, and there's even room for a functional hurdy-gurdy, which is its own separate musical instrument that they fit into the apprehension engine. And what's even crazier is this device can be made by anybody. There exists a channel called Film Masters that did a whole 20 part series going over how to build your own apprehension engine at home for less than $100. So I built one, all by myself. You were looking at almost a full month of prep, a week of work, and many, many trips to Home Depot. Here for the fifth time this week, bro. Oh my God. It was worth it though, right? I mean, it looks pretty decent. I think it does look like the apprehension engine, but it's not without its problems. For one, the hurdy-gurdy wheel doesn't even reach the strings. The crank for it is one crank away from snapping in half. I also bought the wrong strings for the smaller guitar neck, so there isn't even any strings attached. And I also bought the wrong sized reverb tank. Speaking of which, yeah. All in all, I took this as a learning experience. With a few tweaks and gathering more parts, I'm pretty sure I could have made a decently working apprehension engine, but I'd spent so much time on this and getting to the end only to have none of the right parts. It just felt like having a long day at work and then right when you get home and you're about to put your keys in the door, you fumble and drop them. Like that type of frustration is what I had while making this. so. I don't feel too bad leaving the project at this point of progress just for the video. And honestly, it's not too bad. I mean, the rulers and the horror box still work pretty darn well. Dolphins. There is talk around the internet of a song that was made by Avril Lavigne titled Dolphins. If you took yourself to Google right now and searched it up, you might be surprised to see quite a few responses from websites like stllyrics.com or songlyrics.com. But if you wanted to hear the actual song, it doesn't exist. Like, at all. So what's the story here? Well, the earliest known version of this made-up song takes us all the way back to 2007. Using the Wayback Machine in tandem with a few lyric websites, it appears the earliest known posting of these lyrics is back in July of 2007 on a website titled Lyrics Mode. 
So it supposedly existed for nearly 16 years with no trace of any listenable song. The prevailing theory of all the ones that I've read is that someone out there in the world submitted these fake lyrics as a joke in 2007. This adds up as Avril Lavigne's popularity absolutely spiked in 2007. I specifically remember being driven everywhere and always hearing her blasting on the radio during that time. And if you weren't alive to live through that experience, just taking a look at Google Trends will mirror this point. You'll see around April 2007 was the maximum height of her notoriety, at least on the internet. It's extremely likely that during the height of her success, some internet troll out there in the world submitted these fake lyrics as a joke amongst their peers, or a super fan wrote these lyrics and put them on this website in the hopes that Avril Lavigne would see them and then choose to sing them or perform them at one of her concerts. And for those that really want to hear what the song might have sounded like, here's an amazing gem I found on YouTube of someone singing the existing lyrics with the help of their ukulele. Of me, of me, I'm singing this song that's totally by Avril Lavigne and it's totally not just some fake lyrics someone posted on the internet that I came up with a tune for. It's called Dolphins, and here you go. The brown note. This sound makes you poop. Seriously, that's why it's called the brown note. And yes, I included this because it was funny. Now, does it actually deliver on what's promised? I did not think that this sound would actually make me poop, so I decided to test it. And of course, I can't poop without a belly full of food, so I drove all the way to Taco Bell just for this video. Taco Bell, baby, Taco Bell. Can I get, uh, Three of the spicy potato soft tacos. Thank you. God, I felt so awkward. <laughs> God, I felt so fucking So I went to Taco Bell and had a full belly in my stomach. I let it rest for around 30 minutes and then I decided to get up, sit down, and listen to the full six minutes of the brown note. And I went into this fully knowing the risk. I ate as much food as I could. I wore my least favorite underwear and everything and Nope, nothing happened. Now I will say, I don't know if it was because I knew what the brown note was supposed to do to me, but I did experience some level of anxiety and nausea while listening to the brown note. However, I do think it could have just been the placebo effect happening on me because in the back of my head, I knew there was supposed to be something that happened to my body. So that could definitely be attributed to it but I have heard that frequencies and specific frequencies can definitely have an effect on the human body. But no, this one does not make you poop. Flamethrower saxophones. Yes, there does exist saxophones that literally blow fire out the end when you play music. Nicknamed the Flamophone, there is a single propane tank attached to the horn and a propellant device that gives the sax player complete control over how much propane comes out. The man playing the saxophone in this clip is Stefan Zeniuk, the creator of the Flamophone. He stated that he formed the idea back in 2007, but it didn't come to fruition until nearly 2010 when he met a man named Ben Bartel. There's a whole list of conspiracies and theories surrounding this instrument and whether or not it's been the cause of a bunch of accidents at the time of this article being written. There appears to have been no injuries from this crazy instrument, which is something that I hope stays the same going forward. 433. 4 minutes and 33 seconds of silence. That is what 433 stands for. A piece written by renowned John Cage, simply titled 433, requires all of the performers in the orchestra to be absolutely silent for 4 minutes and 33 seconds. And there is real performances of this piece done by big orchestras. It entails the conductor walking up, starting the piece, and then just absolute 
silence for four minutes and 33 seconds. Common sense would lead you to believe if you read this music on a piece of paper, it would be completely blank with a title on top that says four minutes and 33 seconds. But that is actually not the case. In music, there is a term known as a tacit, which indicates that performers do not make a sound and they are to only rest. The piece known as 433 consists of three different tacits that the conductor really does cue the orchestra players on. Some people have stated experiencing extreme uncomfortability and being unsettled by the performance. I can't help but laugh when I see the facial expressions that the conductor makes during the tacit cues, but on a more serious note, the person who made this, John Cage, is an absolute legend who has always toyed with what can be considered as music. He's also famous for creating another composition known as Water Walk, a piece that requires a bathtub, toy fish, a pressure cooker, a grand piano, and all sorts of other weird stuff in order to be properly played. And judging by the amount of views that this composition has, it really goes to show that anyone can make music that can be enjoyed by many. The Singing Ringing Tree. There exists a sculpture located in England that is made up of pipes that allow for wind to pass through and create this unnerving sound. From reading a few comments underneath that video, it appears that some people believe this sculpture was created in order to produce a pleasant, more lovely sound. But due to errors during construction, they ended up creating this mess. However, I have not been able to find any reliable source confirming this outside of random comments on forums like Reddit or random articles, so I don't think it's a true fact, but I wanted to include that in case someone else could shed some more light on this sculpture. Also, some of the videos that have been shot of the singing ringing tree sculpture have a very pleasant sound, such as the one the creator of the sculpture posted himself on Vimeo, and others that remain on YouTube share this distinct piercing sound as opposed to the very lovely and pleasant one. With the difference most likely being the camera and mic quality and also just the wind hitting the pipes at a certain angle that might produce a different sound depending on when you record it. Before I move on, I had to mention that this reminded me of that one episode from Spongebob where he constructs big stone versions of himself to produce music. Of course, that music was more pleasant, while this one is more on the unsettling side of things. Consume Red Consume Red is an album created by the Japanese noise band Ground Zero. This album falls under the category of noise music, or at least some variation of noise music. To catch anyone up to speed who may have no experience with noise music, it's essentially full and loud music that has tons of layered and layered instruments, vocals, noises, and all the like to produce a very signature sound that the genre is known for. Consume Red lands itself on today's video for having some merit to the art that is noise music. As with all my videos, I try my best to pay respect to whatever new thing I'm learning about, no matter how stupid or weird it feels on the surface and noise music is no different. My first impressions of this album were very obviously along the lines of, why the hell would someone choose to listen to this? But in a very similar experience to albums like Everywhere at the End of Time, which we will go over later, Ground Zero managed to create a very unsettling experience with their album, Consume Red. I keep saying album, which feels disingenuous because there's only really one track on Consume Red, and this is going to be a running theme throughout this video. You're going to be hearing me use the word album to describe things that aren't what you would usually call an album. This is an album, but it only has one track on it. And that one track from Consume Red is nearly an hour long. And it consists of the same sound loop throughout the entirety of the 57 minutes coming in and out of your ears as more and more layers are dropped and try to cover it up. And the reason I compare this album to something like Everywhere at the End of Time is because of its clear, similar understanding of messing with the human mind by forcing you to become familiar with a signature sound profile that slowly but surely gets muddled up 
and ruined by the end of the entire experience. Having listened to Consume Red all the way through, I can tell you firsthand that there were times where my anxiety jumped through the roof and times where the sound almost calmed me down back to a normal headspace. Back down to my equilibrium, if you will. I'd call the piece disturbing for the sheer amount of emotions that it can run you through in such a short amount of time. And if you want to check it out yourself, I recommend really setting time aside to engross yourself in the album rather than doing that thing that people do to protect themselves from being scared, which is like just putting it on to laugh at or just being like, this isn't even that scary. Like, of course, it's not going to be scary if you have your emotional guard up. But if you allow yourself to let the music do its thing, it can be quite the unique experience, at least in my opinion. And that's going to be a common thing with most of these things. I don't think that everyone is going to experience this because some people just don't want to let that experience happen. So if you are going to listen to this, make sure you're in the right setting and the right place and you're ready to go through that stuff. Anyways, let's move on to the next piece on the disturbing music iceberg. Guchin's Sixth String. I might mispronounce this name a lot. I'm pretty sure it is pronounced Guchin, but one of the most famous instruments that is home to China is the Qin or otherwise known as the Guchin. If you've ever watched Kung Fu Hustle before, then you actually know what this instrument is. The nighttime attack from that movie where these two guys play that really weird string instrument, that instrument's actually the Guchin. Obviously, this is a more comedic use of the instrument, but on a more serious note, there is a bit of story or lore regarding the amount of strings that are used on the Qin. Nowadays, there are a total of seven strings on the instrument, but it's said that there were originally only five strings, with each string corresponding to the five elements in Chinese culture. Wood, water, fire, gold, and earth. The next two strings were said to be added on later by Emperor Wen and Emperor Wu, respectively. Based on the websites that I came across while researching this, it appears that the reason string number six was added was in honor of the son of Zhao Wen Wang, who allegedly requested a sixth string be added to mourn his son's death, and the seventh string being added sometime later by Zhu Wu Wang as a means to motivate his troops into going to battle. I don't know how much is true regarding these stories behind the two strings, but I can assure you that the two emperors did in fact make changes. As for the reasons for the changes, I can't really say for sure. I managed to find one article written by Yu Ting Jian or Yu Tong Jiang. They go by two different names apparently. I found them by two different names. And this person seems to be pretty well versed in music, specifically in the area of Chinese music. I also cross checked this website with another one, and the story remains the same. So I think it's fair to say that this is a reputable source, but even then, she only states the emperor's changed the strings without stating exactly why they chose to change the amount of strings. I wanted to put that out there so everyone knows that this topic is sort of up in the air, but hopefully someone who knows more about Chinese music history can correct me in the comments. Beethoven's Letter Most of us know Beethoven for being one of the most influential composers to have ever lived, with pieces of his being taught even now. And I'm sure many of us have that one friend who always has to play for release whenever they see a piano. But besides his more well-known compositions, there exists a letter written by him that I can't say I've seen talked about pretty much anywhere. The Heiligenstahl Testament is a letter that was written by Beethoven to his brothers Karl and Johann. Before I say anything, I want to be transparent. I obviously can't read German myself, so I listened to two separate translations of the letter, as well as going over a few written translations. So even though there might be some ideas or words lost in that translation, I think the main points of the letter still stands. With the main point of the letter being Beethoven expressing his struggle with his ever increasing deafness. And yes, you heard that right. If you already did not know, Beethoven did struggle with deafness. He was becoming deaf the older that he got, which I know is ironic, but to get at the point across of how mentally hard this was and how kind of crazy this letter is that he wrote, I figured I would read an excerpt directly from a translation that I found and then talk about it more in depth after the fact. So here is the excerpt. 
I was compelled early to isolate myself, to live in loneliness. When I at times tried to forget all this, oh how harshly I was repulsed by the doubly sad experience of my bad hearing. And yet, it was impossible for me to say to men, speak louder, shout, for I am deaf. Ah, how could I possibly admit such an infirmity in the one sense which I should have been more perfect in me than in others? For those that fell asleep listening to that, basically Beethoven was struggling with the irony of the situation. How could me, Beethoven, this amazing composer, how could I be losing my hearing? When I walk down the street and I see all these people who have perfect hearing that don't even need it. Can you imagine how hard that must have been back then to really struggle with that and especially during a time when mental health was definitely not on anyone's radar and he expresses this kind of thing in the letter he speaks of times where he contemplated ending his own life stating the humiliation he felt when he was next to people that would exclaim hearing a flute in the distance or hearing a shepherd singing nearby and he would hear absolutely nothing with the only thing keeping him from doing that dark deed being as he calls it his art his music is what kept him alive, explaining that he wanted to put all into his art before passing. And the reason I wanted to talk about this too was just how much of a genius this guy was. To be able to see past your own years this far into the future, he literally speaks in the letter about how he wanted people in the future to be able to listen to his music because although he is going to be gone, the legacy of his music will be able to be enjoyed by many from years to come. And to have that kind of mindset at the time that he was, there was no internet back then. People have no idea how long this kind of thing could have lasted. And it's just crazy to me that he even talks of what to do with this letter after his death. Here's another excerpt to explain that. As soon as I am dead, if Dr. Schmid is still alive, ask him in my name to describe my malady and attach this document to the history of my illness so that so far as possible, at least the world may become reconciled with me after my death. Now, I may be reading this wrong, but I swear this comes off as Beethoven nonchalantly assuming that the world would even care to know about his death and why it happened. And the crazy part is we do care. <laughs> I'm literally making a video about this, about this guy's death. Like we do care about this guy's death and we do care about what happened to him and the history of this guy. It's just insane that he knew the world would question his death and wonder what thoughts were in his mind surrounding his illness. It just blows my mind that all that time ago, he thought to even write that in. And it's the reasons you're all hearing this piece now. The fact that he, he went and wrote that letter and is why I'm even expressing all of his thoughts to you. In a way, it's kind of comforting knowing that one of the world's greatest composers also had to struggle with these mental health battles. And it gets even more disturbing and sad when you realize just how lonely it must have been to deal with those problems in the early 1800s, when I'm sure that mental health was the least of everyone's worries. It's even referenced in the letter that his brothers were mad at him for not hanging out or being in contact with them. And the letter basically explains why he felt he needed to be by his lonesome. If you want to experience the entire letter yourself without having to read it, I will leave a link to a YouTube video that I think captures the overall essence and vibe of Beethoven's letter very well. Baphomet Kuhn. Baphomet Kuhn is a YouTube channel that I've talked about like two or three times at this point, but the reason I felt the need to add this is because I think it's a fantastic introduction into the world of disturbing music videos. This is a channel that has gone through a lot of changes throughout the years. At first glance, there might appear to be only 12 videos on the channel, but this is not true. There are tons of videos if you go under the short section. For whatever reason, during YouTube's changes to a more short-oriented website, they changed all of Baphomet Kuhn's videos from normal videos that you could see on the channel to shorts. So all of Baphomet Kuhn's videos are mostly under shorts, but you can watch any of these. And a lot of these are just very off-putting at first if you're not used to this type of content. You'll find many videos labeled with the good old MV tag that obviously means music video. Most of these appear to just be odd and disturbing imagery interspliced with music to pair alongside. But if you really pay attention to everything, the visuals, the music, the pacing, it's clear that Baphomet Kuhn puts a lot of work into what they do. For example, MV Penelope Scott might just be some 
weird pictures with blacked out figures for sake of creeping out the viewer. But if we dive just a tad deeper, what I think is the real meaning shines through. This music video could very well be about a breakup of some sort, not necessarily a romantic relationship, but any kind of relationship, especially ending with that last line, and so used implying that this person they are making the video about used them in some kind of sick, twisted way to get what they want and then toss them aside, as we can see from the visuals. This is just one example of many, many music videos that Bath Mancun has put out. And if you want to dip your toes into the world of disturbing music videos, I think they are a fantastic introduction. I highly recommend watching anything that they've made just in general. They don't post too often as of right now but they have a lot of great content and i think if you're ever wondering why people watch like disturbing stuff you might find yourself binging the entire channel and then at the end of it revisiting some videos because they bring you some kind of odd comfort now i'll leave a link below to a playlist of my personal favorites of the channel and a little bonus video i made two years ago going over a personal theory of mine regarding bath mccoon's channel AI music. I really debated putting this one on the iceberg because I know that AI is just a huge hot topic right now to be talked about, but I know I can't be the only one who feels a bit weird about AI covers of songs, specifically covers of songs where the artist is deceased and people are just using their voice for simple views. For example, the other day I was scrolling on TikTok when I came across a Michael Jackson AI cover of I Feel It Coming by The Weeknd. And while the song did sound pretty good, it just feels gross. Like this guy is six feet under and people are just using his voice without anyone's permission. It just feels a little bit sickening to me. And lately I've been viewing the AI covers of songs in a similar vein to deepfakes that where people use popular streamers faces for any type of nefarious use. Of course, I think it's way more innocent to make AI music than it is to make deepfakes. I just think it's something that society needs to figure out before it gets way too out of hand, because at the rate that we're going at, I can see a future where AI gets so good that people like The Weeknd or Ariana Grande don't even need to record or write their own songs anymore. They can just license their voice to companies to make money for them. We are already even seeing this with that one AI Drake and Weekend song, Heart on My Sleeve, which was met with a lot of positive reception. It's crazy because this is very reminiscent of episodes from Black Mirror like Joan is Awful, one of the newest episodes that tackles this topic entirely. The main theme I want to get across is what if we get to a point where we don't need artists or creators to physically be present anymore. We know it's possible to project these kinds of images onto a big stage and have people and crowds go crazy for them. So if we trace that line of logic down a bit further, it's entirely possible that we'll be in a future where people like Drake, Taylor Swift, Billie Eilish, they can just have AIs create their own music and then have them perform it live for them without having to be there. And as a consumer, like what does that make us? There's tons of questions, and, and the more you try to answer them, the more disturbing the entire thing gets. And with all of that said, that will bring us to layer two of the disturbing music iceberg. Layer two is made up of just weird sounding music. I'm talking about music that is created to evoke emotional distress in someone, along with some real life events intertwined to bring the entire layer together. Let's get layer two started by talking about the first piece. The Banshee, a piano composition made by Henry Cowell in the 1920s, is named The Banshee. It's known amongst pianists as being the first ever piano piece that is performed without touching any of the piano keys. Your mind might immediately jump to compositions like 433, assuming that if no physical keys are being pressed down on the piano, then it must mean there is another composition that is just complete silence. But that's not true with this piece. While there are no physical keys being pressed down, the strings are manually plucked by the pianist's fingers and nails with the help of a friend holding down the pedal to produce this quite disturbing sound. I don't know, man. It feels like this guy is just 
violating this piano by playing this song and it is such a different feeling that I get in my stomach when I watch this being played. Hopefully someone out there can relate to that, uh, but without further ado, let's move on to the next item on the iceberg. Songs of Schizophrenia. There is a full 10 track album that is supposed to get across what it is like to deal with schizophrenia. And I'll admit, I do love the idea of albums trying to get across a mental illness through sheer sounds and music. Similar, again, to Everywhere at the End of Time with Dementia, but the first time I heard this Songs of Schizophrenia, it, it caught me off guard. And honestly, it made me laugh a little bit from how abrupt they were with the uh, voice in people's heads. I'll even play a track for you so you can listen to it and give me your opinion on Songs of Schizophrenia. Listen up. I'm not gonna repeat myself. I ain't trying to be creepy and trying to be strange. What do you think of this song? Well, you know what? Doesn't matter. And I know it's not just me that feels this way because I showed a few friends this piece on Discord while I was researching it because I was laughing so hard from hearing it the first time that they also wanted to experience it. I showed them the same song I was listening to and every single person I showed it to also agreed that it was just so abrupt and so badly executed. Um, but we all thought it tried. And, it, and it's a, it was a cool thing to try and attempt to get across schizophrenia. I think what Songs of Schizophrenia got wrong when it came to getting across schizophrenia is that they tried to get across that the voices in people's heads were almost capable of independent thought. And that independent thought was going to try and change this person and make them do like very horrible things. From my understanding of schizophrenia, the people who struggle with it often describe themselves as suffering from hallucinations of every single sense in a person. And I'm talking, of course, about the five senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. A lot of people that have schizophrenia have described hearing auditory hallucinations, but it's very real. Like hearing footsteps in your house from the other room or hearing a voice calling out to you from the other room, but it's not like an echoing crazy chamber-like thing like in songs of schizophrenia it's as if it's really happening and when these people get up and go about their daily lives when they go inspect these hallucinations they find that there's nobody there and their response to different stimuli in their environment can be drastically detrimental to whatever they're doing for example one of the stories that i read online was someone was driving and there was a car that was following them for just a little bit too long and they started convincing themselves that people were out to get them and this led them down a rabbit hole of crazy thoughts where they thought the entire government and the entire world was conspiring against them and they were in the wrong universe like that is the type of stuff that people with schizophrenia deal with and while people that do have this do struggle with what is described in songs of schizophrenia like having this loud voice that comes in your head and tries to convince you of these things that is not the only thing that these people struggle with so i feel like not explaining all of this and leaving it up for debate is just not me doing my job properly so hopefully i was able to get across what schizophrenia is really like that is not the entirety of what this entails, I, there's a lot more nuance to schizophrenia, but I hope I was able to give a sound explanation. I do think this earned itself a spot on the list though, because some of the songs with how abrupt the voice is and how loud it is can be anxiety inducing. And it made me personally with some of them feel a little bit of a fight or flight response. But just like how people get used to the scares at like Halloween Horror Nights or Not Scary Farm, you might find yourself chuckling over the sudden voice coming out when hearing songs of schizophrenia. And while we're on the topic talking about this, I would love to know if anyone out there watching this has found a song or piece of music that does successfully get across what it's really like to have schizophrenia. Field Haulers. 
if you don't do well with the topic of slavery, I definitely do not recommend listening to this section of the video. So here is your warning to step away from this section and go click off somewhere else. If you're still here, then let's get into field haulers. So field haulers are songs that were primarily sung by slaves in the United States. The way in which field haulers differentiates itself from just silly little work jingles that you sing to make the work go faster is that these were usually sung by one single person working in the fields with other people that are working around the singer chiming in here and there with a cry or a hauler, which is where the name field haulers comes from. Here is a real life example of a field hauler by Belton Sutherland. Future right here. So originally I did have the Belton Sutherland field hauler in this section playing, but YouTube does not want me to play it for some reason. Apparently it is copyrighted, which makes no sense. Um, but I do have another song playing later in this section anyway, so you kind of get a taste for what the field hauler is. I'll leave a link to it below because it is a beautiful piece of music. If you want to watch the unedited version of this video that you're watching, go ahead and go to the Patreon. It's only three bucks and you will be able to see the unedited version that you should have been able to watch in the first place. Uh, I will say that one is also blocked in Russia for some reason. So if you are watching from Russia, even if you go to the Patreon, you probably won't be able to see the video. Now I'm going to let old me get back to explaining the field haulers. You'll notice a lot of these songs come straight from the heart, but the full effect of field haulers has almost completely been lost to time. Thankfully, there are some scraping by around YouTube that seem to be fully intact. There's one I found called The Murderer's Home, who was sang by Henry Jimson Wallace and a few unidentified inmates. Keep in mind, this appears to be more of a prisoner song, which is a little different than a field hauler in that the other workers are more involved in the overall sound, but I figured this would be a great representation of the full effect of experiencing a field hauler in person. Ain't got no In Jimson's version, you can really hear how powerful these types of songs were, especially during a time where African Americans were forced onto the field for an unreasonable amount of hours. The only thing that would pass the time faster was to participate in these field haulers. The more you think about it, the more depressing the entire situation becomes. It's just wild to me that, you know, I, I live in 2023. I'm able to sit in my cushy chair, my in my cushy home, and research these stories and it's just kind of sad where society is right now like i'm learning about these people's horrible lives they had to wake up work the fields and the only thing they that brought joy to them was singing these songs and it's just incredibly disturbing and unfair but to end things on a more light note i'd like to highlight a comment that i saw on belton sutherland's field hauler video because it makes light of the entire situation by saying the real tragedy is how many of these field haulers were simply lost to a long game of telephone. And also explaining how they really did make the work go by easier and faster for those that experienced it. Here is what Allison Shaw 21 had to say on the matter. As a child, we used field haulers to keep time while we worked. Somehow these haulers seemed to make things go easier and often provided some much needed laughs as there were contests to see who could come up with the best or funniest lyrics. Many of them were tongue in cheek jabs at the man, the system, or certain individuals who deserve to be made fun of. Most of this is lost to us and that's a real tragedy. This is the top comment on that video and I think it, it just sums up the point entirely. If you want to take a look at the Belton Sutherland video or Jimson's version of the field hauler, I will leave a link to both of those below. Everywhere at the end of Bikini Bottom. Everywhere at the end of Bikini Bottom is a parody project of the all too famous Everywhere at the End of Time album. If you're watching this channel and this video, there is a good chance you already know about that album. If you have not, Everywhere at the End of Time gained traction for being an artistic representation of what dementia is like. The album's runtime is 6 hours and 30 minutes, and if you listen to the entire thing, it takes you through 6 hours and 30 minutes 
of classical music that slowly over the course of the runtime gets more degraded and eerie sounding while also having a small sense of familiarity. The purpose of that album is to produce an experience that is similar to dementia. And because of its increase in popularity, tons of parodies of the album have come out with most of them being nothing more than just memes. From the ones I've seen and skimmed through, there were two that caught my eye right away. Everywhere at the end of time, but it's for Gen Z, and the one that this segment is on, the Sponge Taker, Everywhere at the End of Bikini Bottom. I chose to go with the SpongeBob one for this segment for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of them being it's less popular, therefore it's less known and it'll be a more interesting topic to talk about. I also have more experience with SpongeBob than Gen Z stuff. And based on first impressions of the album, giving each one a few minutes of, of listening, the SpongeBob one felt more in tune with the point of everywhere at the end of time, which is to get across distressing emotions and to evoke something in you. Most of the other parodies fail in this aspect. A lot of them just have audio taken from whatever the appointed topic is and they run it through a low pass filter or some kind of audio filter. And this one, you know, the SpongeBob one clearly had some real audio work and care put into it, which is why I chose it. At least that's what I gathered from the first few minutes that I listened to. And I can tell you right now, I did listen to the entire thing. And I'm going to have, as proof, uh, I'm going to have this album and Everywhere at the End of Time as a separate video on the channel. I literally recorded myself recording to the full hour and a half of the Sponge Taker and the full six and a half hours of Everywhere at the End of Time. So people know that I really did listen to these things and I do have an experience to talk about. To add on to the point I was making earlier, it just has that SpongeBob quality. Like you can tell it's SpongeBob when you first listen to it but something about it initially feels off, it, like, like a daydream almost. Much like the original Caretaker album, you can tell it's classical music, but something about it is just far from you. Almost like you're outside a room with the door closed and it has one of those muddied up clear windows that makes it so you can only you know, make shapes out of the room, but you can't tell what's in there. If you've ever seen those AI videos like I bet you can't make out an object in this room. It's similar to that. From the very get-go, the experience in Everywhere at the End of Bikini Bottom is set, and it only gets worse the longer you go on. After having listened to the full hour and a half of this album, I can safely say that it lived up to my expectations. And afterwards, I obviously did that thing where you look up explanations of this and there was a video about it that I watched and I thought it was cool and everything and I can say after experiencing the entire thing I did have moments where I was filled with anxiety euphoria emotional distress and even straight up feeling out of breath at times which to be honest sounds so stupid it sounds so ridiculous and silly to experience something like this because of Spongebob I didn't think any of that would happen to me and when I watched uh, the video on it and I read the comments, I, I really thought going into this album, I'm like, I'm not gonna experience any of that. It's not, it's not the original Caretaker album. There's no way I could feel that way about this. And you know, to be even more meta with it, I couldn't tell if I was reacting the way I did because I was recording myself or if I genuinely felt that way about the album. W whatever the case, I think if you want to have the Caretaker experience, without the six and a half hour runtime. And you also grew up with a ton of SpongeBob. Everywhere at the end of Bikini Bottom is a great choice when it comes to wanting to experience what the original Caretaker album set out to do. So what's on it, right? What are we listening to? Uh, most of what I can describe this album as is just very ocean-like sounds intertwined with original SpongeBob sounds. Like there was so many times when I was listening to this where I was like, oh, it's that one song from SpongeBob. I don't know the names of them, but like you could definitely nail the beats down. And I'm pretty sure during times of the recording, I literally was like singing some of the songs like the so weird to hear those sounds like that was literally like such an iconic 
an iconic sound. I hear it in this manner is kind of weird. And hearing all of that coming in and out and some of it not even being finished, like it had hints of the song and then it would just change entirely, it overall added up to a very distressing experience. And a lot of people have interpreted everywhere at the end of Bikini Bottom to be a representation of the flanderization that has happened with Spongebob. With the characters going from fully realized, fleshed out, relatable beings to caricatures of themselves. Citing that as the tracks go on, you lose sense of what is Spongebob music and what isn't. Meeting together into an unrecognizable amalgamation and people comparing the end of the album to where the show is now, an unrecognizable shadow of its former self. That seems to be what the internet thinks, but personally, I feel like this album portrayed what it was like to grow up with Spongebob, or any 90s or 2000s cartoon for that matter. Right around the time when I stopped watching Spongebob, which is around 2010 or so, and if you're thinking in seasons, it was like season six or seven, I slowly moved on from the show. I stopped watching it and it only lived on in quotes. You know, like when I was in high school, I would quote the show amongst friends all the time. And, and this ordeal of quoting it is like the first few tracks on the sponge taker. It, it's happy. It's joyful with just a hint of depressing nostalgia. And as you get older, you, you graduate high school and you move on to college. You, slowly, the show only lives on in memories. Uh, the more you quote it amongst peers, the more you think about what it was like to experience the show for the first time. And even that begins to fade. As you quote the show more and more amongst your friends, the memories of you remembering the episodes start merging together until you've completely forgotten what it was like to experience the show when it came out. There were moments watching this where I recalled different memories of me at school, like going to school and talking to friends and being like, yo, did you see that new episode of SpongeBob? And them coming home with me and watching them as they were released. And we go back to school the next day and talk about it with everyone on the playground. And that experience kind of is how this feels. You know, that beginning part, it's just really happy and fun to quote it, getting older and you're looking back on everything. That's how the first like 50 to 60 minutes of this album feels. And the last 20 minutes of this album could be interpreted as one coming to terms with the fact that their childhood is over. And no amount of rewatching it, quoting it, or even showing your kids the show when you're older will ever truly bring back to you what it was like to experience it for the first time. With the last few seconds of the album ending with this blissful change from muffled ocean to clear audio of water hitting the sand on a beach symbolizing that it's okay that you can't experience it all again. We should just be happy that we were on the journey in the first place. And that about sums up my experience with Everywhere at the End of Bikini Bottom. And you can tell me in the comments all you want about how this interpretation might belong on something like, I'm 14 and this is deep. <laughs> but this show holds a special place in people's hearts. You know, all the problems I experienced as a kid from living in a broken home to all the times, all the, all the trauma of cops asking me who I want to live with to even like serious health concerns from when I was a very young kid. All of that would fade away when this show would come on Nickelodeon. Like the world stopped for 30 minutes just to bring me some entertainment and much needed happiness into my life. And I know if I hold the show to this crazy standard, then there has to be other people who feel the same way, but are too scared of sounding cringe for placing a cartoon about a sponge this high on a pedestal. So let me know what you think below and let's just move on to the next piece of disturbing music. Everywhere at the end of time. I seriously did not expect this album to live up to the expectations that were set forth. I really thought going into this that I would just be bored out of my mind listening to classical music for six and a half hours, but boy was I wrong. When I booted up the album, I was already shocked to hear that famous TikTok sound that is always stitched with weird and nostalgic videos. Which makes sense in hindsight considering the content that is usually associated with those TikToks, but from that you can probably tell my experience with Everywhere at the End of Time. I had pretty much not listened to it 
at all before making this video. As mentioned before, the album was constructed in such a way that it is meant to simulate what it's like to experience dementia. Sounds like an abstract concept, but in practice, it holds up surprisingly well. It achieves this by breaking down the album into six stages, with stages one through three being the early stages of dementia. That time in your life where you are noticing early signs, but you deny, deny, deny that you are experiencing any type of illness until it's already too late. Then stages four through six kick in and you are left absolutely clueless as to what's going on around you. And just as proof, so you understand that I am coming from a place of personal experience with everywhere at the end of time, I will be leaving, as said before, a seven hour VOD up of me listening to everywhere at the end of time, the full six and a half hour runtime and the sponge taker album. I doubt any of you guys are actually going to watch the entire thing, but feel free. Uh, it's almost like a listen along if you want to watch that, but back on topic. One of the ways that I would try to stay focused during those six hours was to speak into the mic whenever a new track started. Whenever a new track would start, I would stop whatever I was thinking about or doing and I would just go to the list of track names and I would read off whatever the new track was. That was the first song. Next song is We Don't Have Many Days. It's pretty beautiful music so far, I'm gonna be honest. This is like, yeah. Song five on, I think it's uh, album A. Slightly bewildered. Track C two. And I believe it's the second uh, second track on stage two. Misplaced in time. I believe we're on the next song. Track three of side of stage two. What does it matter? How my heart how my heart breaks. I did this for every single song on Everywhere at the end of time. But in those six hours, there were times where I would forget what track we were on, or even not be aware that we had switched to a new track at all. Apparently we swapped songs at some point, I don't even remember that. We're on the fourth song apparently, or the, what song is this? One, two, three, four. Fourth song, sudden time regression into isolation. I didn't even notice we swapped songs. I thought this was the same one. Dude, whenever the fucking, whenever the little bleeps of music comes in, it makes me want to tear up a little bit. I don't know why. Simply because the further you get into the album, the more everything starts to blend together. Much like that of a victim of dementia. At first, you begin with small quirks like asking the same question over and over again, and then you begin questioning why you were asking that question in the first place, further spiraling into a hole of absolute nonsense to any outside observer, leaving you isolated in your own little world. And this album really achieves this to the fullest. I think the biggest issue that most people experience when coming into contact with the caretaker, whether it's you listening to the full six and a half hour runtime, or even just hearing that little snippet from TikTok, you will most likely be craving more music just like it. And if that described you, you're in luck. The creator of Everywhere at the End of Time, Leland Kirby, who donned the moniker of the caretaker in his later years, has a ton of lesser known works that have essentially the same type of sound. We have these three albums from the time that Leland Kirby was known simply as The Stranger, releasing the albums The Stranger, Bleak Low, and Watching Dead Empires in Decay. Or that time when Leland Kirby operated with his friend under the company VVM, otherwise known as Volume vs. Mass, releasing a plethora of music, some obviously longer than others, with each one priming him for his upcoming debut as The Caretaker, the name that he would become most known for. But for just a second, let's take a jump back from the latest work from Leland Kirby, because when my ears took a listen back to his older discography from each of his aliases, it really felt like watching someone master every single thing they possibly could leading up to a big finale, with that big finale being everywhere at the end of time. Kirby has even expressed his frustration releasing everywhere at the end of time, stating, I can't carry on for another 10 years looping old 1920s music. 
clearly seeking to make a final hoorah while also poking fun at old tracks that he's released. Because yes, Everywhere at the End of Time does dive back into some of the other Caretaker's back catalog. Keep in mind that the Caretaker had released three other projects prior to Everywhere at the End of Time. And as a last parting gift, if you will, to fans of his final project, he released Everywhere and Empty Bliss a collection of unreleased works. The biggest takeaway from Everywhere at the End of Time is a lesson in all good things should come to an end, and not just the theme or purpose of the album, but also the creator choosing to make it his last big project for the foreseeable future. I think if you want a taste of what Everywhere at the End of Time has to offer you, but you don't think that a six hour runtime is attractive, and you don't care for the SpongeBob album, even though I think it's great at getting across the same exact emotions, take a look at Leland Kirby's other works. I highly recommend An Empty Bliss Beyond This World, a 52 minute album that runs you through the same emotional roller coaster that Everywhere at the End of Time is known for, minus the big runtime. And although it isn't exactly the same, it's a nice sneak peek at what Leland Kirby has to offer. Again, if you really want to, I will leave that video unlisted of me listening to the entirety of the Sponge Taker and the entirety of the Caretaker album. I don't know why you would want to watch the full seven and a half hour video of that, but I will leave it up for anyone that is curious. I might make that video public in a few days, but I do want to give this video some time to perform because like most YouTubers, I have some weird superstition when it comes to uploading videos and publishing them back to back like that. So let me know your thoughts below on not just the caretaker, but any experience with anything alike, whether it be one of the parody albums or even one of Leland Kirby's lesser known works. For all you know, you could be introducing one of us to a hidden gem that no one even knew existed. Threnody for the victims of Hiroshima. A bit hard to follow up that explanation of everywhere at the end of time, but I don't think you'll be disappointed with this musical piece. Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima is a composition created by Christoph Penderecki. The original title of the piece was 837. The name change came after Penderecki finished the composition. He changed it from 837 to simply Tren, T-R-E-N, and then later in 1961, when a critic talked about the piece in their publication, it drove Penderecki to change the name entirely. Here is a quote taken from that critic's review. This is a profoundly disturbing piece of apparently hopeless cataclysmic atmosphere in a highly individual technique of composition and instrumentation. Penderecki changed the name from simply Tren, which means Threnody translated to English, to this long title, which in English, translates to Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima. I said all of that just so I could be clear and explain that this piece was not created with the Hiroshima incident in mind, but Penderecki felt that the composition fit so well with the event that he just rolled with a new name. And for good reason. Uh, there is a comment that exists on YouTube under the composition that perfectly explains how the song goes. I'll skip to 7 minutes and 46 seconds so you can all get a taste of what this composition holds. Just kidding, there's going to be no audio for this section because I was unable to publish the video because it was blocked if I try to use the audio from this symphony. Uh, it is a really beautiful piece and I do recommend watching it. I will link it below. If you want to hear the full piece with this footage, go ahead and subscribe to the Patreon. Uh, the unedited version of this video is on the Patreon if you want to go check that out. Um, but yeah, for, for whatever reason, I cannot post this with the uh, music, but I'll let Ray get back to explaining what this is. Absolutely heart-wrenching when visualizing what it might have been like to live through such a horrific event. The piece does an incredible job of forcing the viewer to experience full-on dread and despair. Now, it's truly a shame that Penderecki's most famous work is this. Not to say that it's not good, but most people listen to this one piece and stop there. When he has tons upon tons of amazing compositions that will push you through the same emotional experience as Threnody for the Victims of Hiroshima. Unfortunately, Penderecki did pass away in 2020. Rest in peace to this just great composer. 
Thankfully, we still have access to his work, which will live on beyond his years as many of these compositions can still be found on YouTube. Miki Matsubura. If you've heard this song floating around on TikTok or the internet in general, then you are already familiar with Miki Matsubura. She left her impact on Japanese pop music with her all-time classic, Mayonaka no Door, otherwise known as Stay With Me, which is what we just heard playing. With such a fun pop sound, you'd probably least expect to find her on a list like this, especially down towards the end of layer two. But the reason she is on here is because of some emails that left a lasting impression on her friends, family, and fans of her music. Thanks to a TV program that featured the life of Miki Matsubura, which now lives on YouTube, we can easily get an explanation for what happened to Miki Matsubura. Let's start with the first email she ever sent that marks the start to the end of her life. Near the end of the year 2000, Miki Matsubura sent a mass email to any corporations that were working with her, simply stating she could not continue her music career due to, in her words, an uncontrolled situation. This uncontrolled situation, as she puts it, would later on be revealed, but at the time, everyone was left in the dark. It wouldn't be until years later that people got an answer as to what happened to her. She had been battling cervical cancer and through her other emails, which were released close to her death, with one being read by her father at her funeral, it's clear that Miki had a sudden realization about life when she got diagnosed. A realization that she says, only those who are sick and dying can get. And I'm not gonna lie, uh, this next part that I, I'm gonna talk about kind of broke my heart a little bit, um, but she wrote that she wished she could reset her life and really put all of her health to use to do the things that mattered. And in that same email, she detailed that in her opinion, her lifestyle is what brought her this disease. And the beautiful thing about all of this is, even though Miki didn't get to truly live out her entire life the way she wanted to, it does appear that she was able to do just that in her last few years of life. She explained the reason she went so in the dark after the year 2000 was so that she could get on with her life. She wanted to live her life to the fullest and be with family. Her father and mother have talked about it on that same TV segment, expressing how intimate her interactions with them were during her last few years of living. On the surface, it might seem a little bit dirty of me to put this on the disturbing music iceberg, but the reason I put any of these things on here isn't just to point at it and go like, like, wow, isn't this crazy and creepy? Some stuff obviously is, but when I talk about entries like this, I really just want to pay respect and give credit where credit is due. Uh, and although Miki Matsubura might not believe that she lived her life in the ways that mattered, I can tell you personally that her music has probably reached more people than she could ever imagine. As bittersweet as it might be, I, I think it's amazing that her determination and her insane work ethic did not go to waste. Her parents and other people that she's worked with have expressed how much of a perfectionist through and through she was, always giving 200% on anything that she did. I mean, just, just look at how happy and passionate she looks while performing. A, a true artist that took pride in her work and it showed. If her last few years of life are to serve any purpose, rather than let her death be used as something just to satisfy people's morbid curiosity, I think we should all look at her life as a reminder to make time for the ones you love the most. So I challenge you, you watching, the next time you hear this song being played, whether it be on TikTok, YouTube, or a random clip on Twitter, find someone you haven't spoken to in a while that you know would love your company and go make some memories that are going to last you a lifetime. And that will conclude layer two. So we're gonna be moving on to layer three of the disturbing music iceberg. This is where we're gonna be moving away from less emotional and deep topics to what you all probably came here for, which is morbid things for morbid curiosity's sake. Let's get this one started with the first topic, piano accidents. As comical as this sounds, Pianos are pretty dangerous instruments that have been the cause of many injuries and even deaths 
Some websites report that over 26 piano incidents have occurred over the last 100 years or so, specifically in the United States, with two of those incidents being eerily close to what you might see in a cartoon. Thanks to a Reddit post that pointed me in the right direction, I found two articles by Washington City Paper and by a website called straightdope.com. These explained how there were two instances where someone's life was taken, like how the cartoons did it, with a, a piano falling from a high place onto somebody. And by the way, shout outs to Una or Una, Una, who is the assistant to the author of this article. Una is said to have scanned through a bunch of old newspaper databases to find these situations. Here it reads, in 1931, a piano was being hoisted up to a second story window when a cornice broke free from the building, falling and taking a mover below with it. And in 1955, a man, ironically surnamed Keys, was crushed under a piano being delivered to his home. In this incident though, the piano wasn't directly on top of him like the man in the 1931 incident. In the 1955 case, the piano and the man fell out the back of a delivery truck, causing the piano to fall on top of him. And the other some 20 deaths that, that are mentioned in this article seem to have occurred due to pianos simply tipping over onto people, with the main victim being kids horsing around near them. And it was during this research on this website that I was led to probably the most gruesome incident involving a piano. There's no way that there's anything else that can top this. So I feel the need, in fact, while we're talking about this, to give a warning about what I'm about to say. Uh, if you don't want to hear anything similar to that saw trap where the walls close in, uh, I would suggest leaving now. This is a pretty extreme case in my opinion. I would not uh, recommend listening to this if you are just not good with anything of the like. Yeah, I'll give you a few seconds to, to do so. Uh, it is pretty tame compared to some of the other entries I'm going to talk about further on down on the list, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. So if we're all good, uh, here is the story. So. A club in San Francisco named San Francisco's Condor Club. It's historic. It's historic for being the first club to feature a topless dancer. And the dancer was named Carol Dota. And she had a unique performance where she would essentially descend from the ceiling, sitting atop a piano. The piano would be lifted using hydraulics in order to give the show just that, you know, that extra pizzazz to the common bystander or the common consumer. Fast forward from 1969 to 1983. Carol Doda is still performing at the Condor, but now there is a man named James Ferrozo who is also employed by the same company. And uh, some websites, uh, it, it's unclear if this guy was a bouncer or an assistant manager. I'm fairly certain based on the amount of websites that said he was a bouncer that he is in fact just a bouncer that worked there. Uh, but nonetheless, he had access to the building after hours. So one day, James, nicknamed Jimmy the Beard, came in after the place was closed with his girlfriend, obviously to partake in some adult activities. And said activities led to them being on top of the piano, which I'm sure at the time seemed like a fun idea. Until one of them accidentally hit the hydraulic lift and before either of them could react, the piano shot straight to the ceiling causing Jimmy to pass. From the description I've read on the many, many articles of this incident, it appears that Jimmy suffocated all the while his girlfriend who somehow survived, I still don't understand how, uh, was stuck underneath a suffering Jimmy for hours. It wasn't until a janitor walked in that she was able to get out. Uh, the janitor alerted the fire department and they managed to free her from this entire situation. Just a truly horrific experience all around. From Jimmy's perspective, like being crushed in that manner and from his girlfriend's perspective, being stuck underneath this person who I can only assume you're starting to fall in love with. Like I can't imagine, I just can't, it's crazy to me. Um, and yes, this definitely has to be one of the most brutal piano related incidents to ever exist. And I'll admit when I researched this the first time, I skimmed over this. I skimmed over this entire story. I skimmed over uh, this mention of the story on the Straight Dope website. And I was just gonna talk about the dangers of cutting piano strings. 
but like obviously i had to talk about this and explain what happened um but what gets me the most and the reason i'm even talking about this is how normal the situation was right you're with your significant other uh, one of you has access to somewhere that's normally public and and you can go in after hours have all the privacy you want you know it, you agree to go it's exciting it's fun only for it to turn into this and i'll admit i got kind of sad reading the 1983 article where they described Ferozo as a real tough guy that was also jolly easygoing and the girlfriend Teresa hill admitted to police that she moved to San Francisco two weeks prior from Seattle and had just begun dating him. I honestly think what occurred that night at the club could realistically happen to anyone, right? Accidents happen all the time. I think this is just a fun night that led to an unfortunate outcome. Castrato. This is a short entry, but I felt it was a good addition for this list. I'm sure most of us know what castration is, but if you don't, Castration is essentially where you remove a man's family jewels. While this detail alone is disturbing enough, there is another level to this that ties into music. The castrato. Singers that were castrated before puberty with the purpose of forcing their voices to fit better in choirs and operas. Here is a famous example on YouTube that has amassed well over 4 million views. This guy you're listening to is well into his 30s. And if that little fact doesn't disturb you, then maybe this one will. Most of these castrados were not given the choice to partake in this. Some of them were forced into doing it. There are examples of people willingly choosing to partake in the procedure, such as the case of, I'm probably gonna mispronounce this, uh, but Gaetano Majorano Caffarelli, who at around age 10, chose to pursue music and using the money given to him by his grandmother partook in this procedure there's even a legal document that proves this and states that he had the desire to have himself castrated and the more sinister part that gets me is whether or not you believe a kid can make this kind of decision on their own it's crazy to me that this was even allowed at one point in time and I don't know. My heart just goes out to all the people who were forced into doing this. Uh, something about listening to the music too. Like when I put on that example from YouTube, when I listened to it myself, I just had this overall feeling of dread. Like this, this guy did not choose to have this voice and he's still choosing music. It's so, such a weird human experience to get across that I don't think I can, which is why I put in the clip. Um, but yeah, it, it is it is just wild to me that this was even allowed at one point in time, but I guess that's just most things when going over history, but let me know your thoughts on this one below. I didn't really know how to feel about it, to be honest. Guitar electrocution. I want to start off by saying that I am an absolute normie when it comes to any type of musical instruments. I don't play anything besides a tiny bit of the ukulele and one song on piano. Besides that, I know nothing. So when I hear the phrase electric guitar, I honestly thought it was just a theme. Like I thought the electric described the thematics of the guitar sound. Uh, when I hear words like amp and ground thrown around when talking about electric guitars, I really just thought it was people making up fancy words for guitar speakers. And as embarrassing as this is to admit, I, I really thought those were just fancy jargon thrown around to make electric guitar users feel cool or whatever uh, and it turns out <laughs> crowns and amps are used because electric guitar strings do hold voltage and the use of amps from my understanding is to stop something like this from happening and one two three four so it wouldn't really happen like that, but you get the point. Uh, from my understanding though, a basic electric guitar setup should look something like this. The electric guitar, a cable running to the amp, and a power cable from the amp to the wall outlet. This setup poses some problems though if your house only has ungrounded outlets. Ungrounded outlets meaning those outlets that only have two prongs instead of three. 
That third prong grounds the entire circuit, which makes it safe to plug things in. Having only two prongs, or if the amp you're using is faulty or broken, you could electrocute yourself on accident. This is because the ungrounded amp will fill your guitar strings with all that electricity, which will then run through your body. But that alone is not enough to do much of anything. Even if your amp is hot and is sending volts through your body, nothing will happen to you until you complete the circuit some way. I'm sure most of you watching this have done that thing where you put socks on and rub your feet on the carpet really fast and then you touch the doorknob and it electrocutes you or whatever. That only happens because obviously rubbing your feet on the ground is charging your body up, right? And you're completing the circuit by touching the doorknob, which is what gives you that shockingness feeling. And that's because when you touch the doorknob, you're grounding yourself to something. Now in the guitar setup, the feet rubbing on the ground is you holding onto the guitar strings. You're not gonna feel anything on your arms or body anywhere. You might feel like a small tingling sensation, but that's all it will ever be. It's not until you ground yourself by accident, which in this case, you touch a doorknob or in another case, you touch something that has metal on it, whether it's like a lamp, a desk or something in your room that has that will ground you, right? That's when the circuit will complete and you could get seriously injured. And this has happened many times, whether it be a guitarist performing standing atop a metal piece of stage when it starts raining and boom, electrocuted and gone in an instant. And it's because they're holding onto the guitar strings so hard, which brings me to my next piece of disturbing information about this. When you get electrocuted, your body tends to seize and tense up. This is why people will tell you if you're gonna touch an outlet or something or some kind of electric thing and you're afraid of getting shocked, you should always do it with the back of your hand. Because if you do it with the back of your hand, you'll clench up this way. Whereas if you have a pole, and you go like this, you're gonna clench it and you won't let go of it. No matter how much you wanna let go of it, your body will not let you. This happens when guitarists are performing. And obviously if you're holding a guitar like this, you're gonna clench it really hard and you will not let go of the guitar. So this means it's almost certain to end in death when people are being electrocuted by the guitar because the way that you hold the guitar will prevent them from getting out of the situation. And this has happened more than a few times, as I said before. Les Harvey falling victim to an ungrounded microphone when he touched it with wet hands while holding onto his guitar, or Keith Ralph, who was playing in his basement of his home while standing on a gas pipe that ended the exact same way. This is why it's important to stay educated and safe when it comes to not just electricity, but really any topic that proves to be dangerous. As long as you're practicing safe techniques, you will most likely be fine. And to keep your spirits up, I thought I'd leave you with a situation that genuinely made me laugh the first time that I saw it. There was a video by What Is So's Guitar Mods where a similar situation happens. This guy is using an old vintage amp and has a very home rigged ghetto light setup. And there is one light in his studio that is made up of a big metal pole. While testing out his guitar, he noticed a light was falling, so he went to go grab it and move it somewhere else, completing the circuit by either the amp being ungrounded or the lamp being ungrounded, leading to this. I genuinely laughed at this because I knew the guy was fine. I knew he was okay after. He lived through this and even made this video sharing how funny the situation was. I literally could not contain my laughter at first when I watched this and just started recording myself to catch my reaction. Oh my God. <laughs> Dude, listen to this guy. He's okay, it's fine. He's okay. It's okay to laugh. Holy shit. Frank Sinatra, My Way. I think there's a fair amount of people that know of this song, but what few may have heard of is a weird phenomenon that took place in the Philippines. Nicknamed the My Way Killings, there were a shocking amount of fatal interactions involving the song My Way by Frank Sinatra, mostly taking place in karaoke bars 
there were reported to be at least six incidents from 2002 to 2012. For example, in 2007, a 29 year old was shot by security at a bar in San Mateo. And the reason is because he was singing out of tune. The guard told him to stop for this reason. And when the 29 year old kept on with the karaoke night, the guard pulled out his firearm and ended this guy's life. An even crazier story took place in 2018 when an elderly man passed away after a fight broke out at a birthday party. Uh, the man began singing the song My Way and was stopped by another man who pulled out a knife and struck the elderly man. These are just two examples of the extremely bizarre cases that have come out of people performing this song in the Philippines. And some seem to truly believe it's just because of people having a distaste for the song, but I just can't fathom someone taking things to such extreme measures for something as innocent as just not liking a song. G-I-S-M. In 1981, the Japanese punk band known as Gizm formed in Tokyo. They would go on to become notorious for their carefree and borderline psychotic theatrics at live shows. Most of this would come from their lead singer, Sakavi. This man has been described by fans of the band as lightning in a bottle. One of those absolutely just raw punk performers that the public knows of simply because of how crazy he was. He's allegedly jumped into crowds while performing and beat up people in the audience. There's rumors of him being part of the Yakuza, uh, but those two details from my research have been left unconfirmed, but I figured I'd mention them as I don't want to disappoint anyone who actually knows of GISM. What is confirmed and we do have tangible proof of is Sakavi taking a chainsaw into the crowd of people, ripping off parts of the stage to chuck at the audience, and even using a flamethrower in the hopes of catching some people lacking. And if you don't believe me, just look at this one dude sitting at the show. You cannot convince me that Sakavi wasn't trying to do some damage. And it's this practice what you preach type of mentality that made GISM an adrenaline inducing experience because you truly did not know what would happen if you attended one of their live shows. And to back all of this up is their music, which did not disappoint at reflecting what the band was all about. This will bring us on to layer four. Layer four is contrived of very traumatic and adult themes. If you don't think you can handle any topics relating to SA victims or stories alike, then I'd recommend just clicking off this video and watching some more lighthearted content that I have available. I usually leave a link to a cozy playlist that I put together of said lighthearted content, such as the three hour Disney iceberg. But if you think you are tough enough and can stomach these topics, then let's move on to the first item on layer four, Daddy by Korn. It's gained a ton of notoriety around the internet for its incredibly sad and disturbing lyrics that tell the story of a kid that was SA'd by their father. It's so blunt and descriptive of the events that took place that I can't even show the lyrics on screen, but a quick Google search and you should immediately understand why. I'm talking about this song because of the vocals that remain in the 17 minute version on YouTube. If you've seen live versions of the song, then you'll know the song really is only five to six minutes long. However, Spotify and YouTube will tell you a different story, with the song boasting a nearly 17 minute runtime. To understand the full scope of this version, we should touch on exactly why the song was written. So Jonathan Davis, the lead singer of Korn, explained that this song was written about his own personal experience as a kid, where adults didn't believe his extremely true story involving similar events. Creating the song almost as a therapeutic experience to get out to the world what it was like to deal with these emotions at such a young age. And as opposed to what you may have been led to believe, uh, the song is not about Davis's father, but instead about a close family relative that he has chosen to remain anonymous about. The way this all relates back to the 17 minute version of the song is what happens in the middle of it. Around the five minute and 30 second mark, which is around the time that the song should end, Jonathan Davis can be heard having a complete 
mental breakdown. And it's because of how truly awful it can be to retell such a traumatic experience from your life. You can hear the pain in Davis' voice having to relive this experience in this manner. The song is so personal to Davis that the band actually refrained from playing this song live for this exact reason. Uh, they really were looking out for Jonathan Davis and they didn't want him to have to go through this on stage. It's such a powerful part of what this song stands for. Even in the live performance that was done at Hellfest, you can physically see how much of a toll it takes on Davis to perform the song live. And my heart goes out to anyone that has to deal with this mental struggle and if somehow Davis sees this video, I'm glad you're performing this song live, man. Like, I can't imagine how hard it must be to put yourself in the headspace to perform this type of thing over and over, but it, I think it's amazing to get this kind of story out there in the world. It might seem like I'm looking too deep into things, but it's, it's artists like this who come out and break the stigma surrounding these types of situations that give people the motivation and the empowerment to come out and feel more comfortable talking to others and sharing their experiences and just seeking help over just because of a song uh, so massive shout outs to jonathan davis and the entirety of corn for performing this song at all because i know for a fact based on just the toll it takes on davis and the comments that i've read that many lives have been set on a path to freedom because of it buyer's market this is an album created by Peter Sotos, and I'm not afraid to admit off rip that I only listened to around 20 minutes of this album, mostly because I felt like I had heard enough, and from what I heard and having skimmed through the rest of the 40 minutes remaining, it's an hour of interviews with victims of SA, which already is a pretty touchy subject. Uh, but what is worse is the fact that the first segment of the album, like technically the first track on the album, is all around children. And these interviews are, are not easy to listen to. And, and this is coming from somebody who has like watched like crazy, horrible things happen and explain them in detail to you guys. Um, I, there was the, f I think one of the first ones I heard was like an adult asking a kid, like the classic, like, you know, show me on this teddy bear where, where he touched you. And what disturbed me the most was just how long that segment was, like how long it was. Like I'm literally getting that pit in my stomach, like right now talking about it. And regardless, my first impression of the album was like, wow, this is amazing that someone compiled all of this together to spread awareness, uh, optimistic. I know. Right. And this definitely changed when I looked into who peter sotos is right at first i really did think this was like a, like some kind of artistic piece meant to kind of similar to daddy by corn you know bring awareness to the subject and break the stigma and this guy is just not that guy there's no way he's written so many books about children who are victims of sa but the books are written from the perspective of the adult uh, so from my perspective you know i'm seeing a guy writing about these stories that he wants out there in the world. And then he creates a full blown album filled with real life accounts that he can listen to whenever he wants. And I, and I hope you see where I'm going with this. But if you don't, I sometimes will see stuff on the internet, like edits of a show that I like, um, a Photoshop picture or a video that I think is cool, but something about it is missing, you know, like, Oh, I think this edit would look better here. And when I search for that missing piece to see if anyone else has done it, you know, maybe I can find it and satisfy that curiosity. And if I find that it doesn't exist, I'll just make it myself. For example, I took, I took apart this edit of one of my favorite shows, Chef, because I didn't like how the original TikToker guy edited the second half of the video. And I think in the same way that I wanted to see this edit done this way, Peter Sotos saw that something from his life was missing and went and created it himself for his own personal use. And, and yes, I am saying that he probably writes from the perspective of the adult because he wants to be that adult. And the guy has tried to back up his work by explaining how, like I said before, like it's simply spreading awareness for the topic um, and having just people's attention being brought to these subjects from a more edgy and brutal standpoint. But like, why would you need to do that? You know, I, I don't think something as bad as this needs the awareness. People already understand how severe and intense this topic is. 
It's like the Charlie and Sneeko situation with cuties. Like you don't need that movie to understand how bad it is. And you definitely don't need to go through these links to prove how bad it is. If you are the one creating it, I feel like once you take that step into creating what you are actively fighting against, you are part of the problem. And no amount of mental gymnastics will ever convince me or anyone for that matter otherwise. Uh, so if you're thinking of listening to Buyer's Market, please keep in mind that this album is most likely not out there for people like you and me to listen to. Uh, there is most likely a minority group that thoroughly enjoys listening to this. Uh, with all of that in mind, uh, let me know what your thoughts on Buyer's Market is. I know I am a little harsh on it, but like, that's just my real opinion. And, and I don't think I can sugarcoat that any other way. And I will stand by that. I'm not, I'm not going to, usually I'm pretty like malleable when it comes to my opinions, but I just don't see how you could spin that any other way. Just having, reading some of the other things that he's made, I just don't see how you can defend that. Um, but well, regardless, let's move on to the last entry on layer four, Pleasure Escape. This is one of the most obscure and vile entries on the iceberg. Pleasure Escape by John Duncan is an album that does not carry your typical content. Similar to Buyer's Market in that the album does not contain any music, Pleasure Escape features two tracks, one titled Blind Date and another titled Move Forward. Blind Date is where the album gets its notorious internet presence from and for very good reason. Uh, the track is said to be a 16 minute recording of John Duncan performing adult-like activities on someone who is no longer alive. Uh, like shades of snuff r73 if you understand what i'm saying uh now i will say i've listened to the entirety of the album and i don't think it's true i don't i don't think the sounds that i was hearing were that uh, the sounds sounded more like someone sawing a piece of wood or like moving a big piece of furniture around on the floor so i think it's safe to say this isn't really what is being described but to humor the album's creations, I'll explain the situation as the as John Duncan sees it, the guy who made the album. So the story that John Duncan is going with is that he got into contact with someone from Mexico and this person sold him someone and allowed this to take place, allowed the album to happen. However, the only source I've managed to find that explains this is the track itself like the track blind date opens with a man explaining all this almost like in a podcast setting but there's no other sources right it's literally just blind date that that starts with someone explaining john duncan's endeavors with this idea and his actions moving forward after said purchase but there exists nowhere else that there is proof this really happened and, and i'm glad there isn't because again this is just one of those things where it's gross and it doesn't need to exist. There's no reason for it to exist. So what I think we have here is nothing more than just shock performance art. And if that brings you comfort, it really shouldn't. If you're thinking like, oh, well, it's okay because it's not real. I, I'm not so sure that we should let someone off the hook that's pretending to do this thing and then pass it off as art. Like, I don't know. I would hope to God that we as a collective community can agree that just because something is shocking, it doesn't automatically make it art. And this is coming from me, who, who has made a whole video essay on Die Fantasy, which I consider to be extremely graphic in its visual storytelling. There is definitely a line that John Duncan's Pleasure Escape crossed that makes it feel more like a desire to create this thing that doesn't exist and then trying to justify it so no one questions it later on. When in reality, all we should be doing as the audience is questioning it. With that said, Pleasure Escape will always be one of the most just insane albums to ever grace the ears of society, regardless of whether it's real or not. This will move us on to layer five of the disturbing music iceberg. And it's at this point, I gotta give another warning. <laughs> So many warnings in this video. I was not prepared for layer five. I'm gonna be honest. Of all the things I've made, I've made some pretty crazy uh, segments on my channel of some pretty crazy things. And, I, and layer five of this iceberg, I was just like, wow, like people are crazy. And 
uh, yeah, I, I'm just going to leave it at that. Take from layer five what you will. But again, if, if you're not comfortable with stuff like snuff R 73 or like buyer's market, stuff like that. Um, yeah, layer five is a little crazier and I think it just shows how deep the rabbit hole goes when it comes to disturbing music. If these things exist and there's probably crazier things out there. Um, so with that said, let's get into the first piece on layer five. Kettle Cadaver Documentary. Kettle Cadaver is a band known for their crazy antics on stage. So crazy that I'm probably not even going to be able to show any clips because there is just so much that I would have to censor if I did show any. Because of how crazy Kettle Cadaver is, there exists a documentary online that is titled Dead Hands Dick Deep that fully explores the craziness of Kettle Cadaver and their lead singer, Edwin Borsheim. I went ahead and with the use of a VPN, because it's not available in the US on Vimeo, I watched the entirety of the hour long documentary and here is my takeaway from it. Kettle Cadaver does not fuck around. And more specifically, Edwin Borsheim does not fuck around. Like, the doc opens up with anecdotes from locals that grew up around the area where Kettle Cadaver was getting bigger, with one of the people living there explaining how Edwin, the band's lead singer and most infamous member, was doing things so crazy on stage that people fully believed that one day Edwin would unalive himself on stage in front of people. This guy is like next level when it comes to any type of mutilation and I can't even begin to describe the things that I saw in the documentary. Originally, when I read about this part of the iceberg and when I was researching it, uh, initially I thought it was just gonna be like layer three or bottom of layer three because it didn't sound too interesting. Uh, and when I read more about it, I moved it down to layer four and then after watching it, due to the nature of the acts that I put my eyeballs through, I just don't think I can, in good faith, put this any higher than the last layer on this iceberg. I was originally even going to make a whole separate video for this, but I feel more safe hiding this away in an iceberg video rather than having it by itself. Um, but the stuff that Edwin did to himself was very reminiscent of some of the gruesome videos I've gone over in the Disturbing Media series, specifically similar to stuff like BME Pain Olympics. This guy really put himself through that kind of stuff. If you've watched my segments on those, I'm not even kidding. Literally imagine the Beamy Pain Olympics live on stage in front of people. This is what this guy did. My, my friend, I have a friend uh, named Chris who also happens to have his own YouTube channel that I'll link below. He described this documentary as it feels like I'm eating lemons. Uh, like the stuff that we were all watching it on discord because i was a little scared to watch about myself and everyone was just like what are you showing me ray and that was the one comment that stuck out to me when i was watching this it feels like i'm eating lemons and one of the phrases that my friends and i kept finding ourselves saying while watching this documentary was finally the most normal thing that we've seen so far and then the next scene it would just cut to like literally some of the most grotesque just plain off-putting behaviors I've ever seen. And oddly enough, there is some good reason to the behaviors. So I don't want anyone to just write this entire thing off as like, oh, you know, it's gross and disgusting because yes, while it is in fact that, there is also a lot of like childhood trauma that I can see. And just speaking from personal experience, I'll have to admit, um, when I saw Edwin come on screen at first, I was confused as to why this guy was being framed as like a complete weirdo. I didn't really get weirdo vibes right away. You know, even his house that we that are you're brought into in the documentary and the decorations, it just seemed like someone who was just really into this type of environment. The same way I wouldn't bash someone for hanging a lot of plants around their house. I didn't bash this guy for having darker themed objects and items in his house, but it quickly turned from just having a theme to really just weird behaviors. For example, Edwin shows off a wooden doll version of his wife and daughter. Here's uh, my beautiful wife. Composing. That's yeah. Eva's daughter, Scarlett and I. Yeah, I'm this black shadow over there. Yeah. So here we got Scarlett. She's hanging out over here. With the only explanation for them existing being that his wife and daughter are gone. And I'm saying gone in, in quotations because 
they never specify if it's because they passed away or they simply just left. So I'm, I'm assuming it's the former and Edwin was grieving, in which case it's not that weird. I mean, people, this felt to me like Edwin's version of building a shrine for his loved ones, which most people do when they're grieving. Another odd behavior was the fact that Edwin sleeps in his own coffin every single day with his mindset being, you wake up in the bed, you will lie in forever. And when you wake up, your first thought should be like, damn, what am I going to do today with this other day in life that was given to me? Uh, of course, Edwin said it a lot more blunt and vulgar than I did, but that's what I can get away with on YouTube. And those two things were not the reason I don't recommend this documentary. It gets a lot worse. And the worst behaviors that were in this doc were showcased through tapes of Edwin in his prime with Kettle Cadaver. From holding real dangerous and bloody grudge matches in his backyard to crazy self-induced trauma before going on stage, uh, this guy is the real deal. So real, in fact, that he ended up on the news for his backyard wrestling matches. San Bernardino's own school of hard knocks. I kind of got into because I've seen a ba backyard wrestling where Kind of where little kids are smashing each other on glass and they're doing things with staple guns. It just makes me want to climb up on top of the, the top ropes. And these things were the real deal. Little kids and adults just fighting each other gladiator style. No worries about each other's safety or whatever. He allowed the use of items such as barbed wire wrapped around the ring, thumbtacks on the ground, staple guns, just crazy stuff. And all this is happening in the backyard of Edwin's house. And most of these activities stem from, at least in my opinion, the relationship that Edwin had with the father figure that he grew up with. Throughout the documentary, he shares a lot of anecdotes from his life. Uh, there's some stories of his dad just coming into his room and ripping stuff out of the wall so that he'll be quiet. Uh, there's one anecdote that really stuck out to me where he explains how he had a lot of posters of heavy metal bands at the time. And he, he loved these bands. He loved these bands to death. He thought they were the coolest thing ever until one day his dad comes in and sees one of the posters and says why do you even bother with this stuff like, like you know they're not even real right like you know that they're all fake and again you know the dad said it in a more vulgar way and aggressive tone but from that day on edwin admitted that he set out to create a band that was entirely real right authentic nothing fake you know we need a poster where i'm bloodied up cool i'm your guy let's do it you want a crazy act on stage where someone puts like X, Y, and Z into my body? I'm your man, you got it. Like this, I feel like Edwin's motivations behind the real and authentic activities of Kettle Cadaver can be traced back to wanting to prove his dad wrong. The whole job, all that wow, I'm gonna make a band one day. And it's gonna be some that no one's gonna laugh at. And man, it's gonna be serious. You know, when you watch that train hit, there's gonna be casualties and it's gonna mean something you know and hopefully one way or another someone like my stepdad will have to have to on some way or another catch a glimpse of that and this is something i think most people can relate to uh, i remember times when i was like 14 bragging to my family about how i made like one tenth of a penny on youtube and all i got was ray come to me when you're making three thousand dollars a month like you'll never make a living off youtube and look at me now, I did it. <laughs> and I haven't even thought about that conversation until like literally right now as I'm writing this. So before you knock down Edwin for all of his, you know, wild actions, cause I'm pretty sure he's done worse stuff in his life. I think it's important to understand the living situation he was in and how all of that affected his mentality moving forward. I'm not trying to fully absolve this guy of anything because I'm sure I'm going to get comments out of the blue that are like, did you know that this guy did this? Like, how can you talk about him like that? I'm sure he did. And I'm not saying he's a bad or a good person for doing any of that. I'm just saying I wanted to hop on here and explain why Edwin Borsheim is Edwin Borsheim. And I say this in all my videos, mostly now, but I could have just done the easy thing and just pointed out how crazy and wild this guy was. But uh, I think there's always something to take away from most of these stories. If you want to hear the full details on Edwin's actions performing on stage, I have a video on Patreon explaining what I saw in the documentary. Uh, obviously, there's going to be no visuals for clear reasons. And I'm just doing that to save everyone the trouble of having to pay for the documentary because I did pay for it with my own money. 
and I don't want to put anyone through what I saw. I don't think it's worth it. It is not worth putting your eyeballs through. Um, but with that out of the way, let's move on to the last item on the disturbing music iceberg. Pseudoscorpion by Zenjin. This is technically considered lost media, even though there is some proof of its existence, at least on the clear net there is. Uh, but once you learn what's potentially on this album, you will understand why I refuse to go searching for this. Pseudoscorpion by Zenjin is an alleged album that contains fragments of cheese pizza. I'm doing air quotations so you understand I'm not really talking about cheese pizza. If you really don't understand what I'm referencing, go watch my segment on Snuffer 73 in this video and then come back here. Anyways, this album is said to contain a lot of really descriptive audio of what I just said and it is just all around not a good piece of media to find. And it's at this point that I like to point out there was a famous Reddit thread that has now been deleted that potentially held the media fire link to Pseudoscorpion by Zenjin. A user by the name of Here Is An Album, having created their username the day of the post in October 19th of 2019, supposedly left a link there by replying to multiple comments that were searching for the album. As said before, the comments are now deleted and are not able to be brought back by the Wayback Machine. Based on the other comments that remain and the fact that many of the comments were deleted, I can only assume that this user did leave a real working link to Pseudoscorpion by Zenjin. It's said that it's similar to Buyer's Market, where it takes real life audio to make up the entire runtime. Uh, here is the supposed album cover, which I'm pretty sure is family friendly the show. Well, on the surface, family friendly, it's definitely not when you consider the context behind the photo and behind the album. Some websites claim that it is real and the listeners of the album said that they managed to do so thanks to Mediafire and another website called Soulseek. Others like myself believe that it's just not worth it to go searching for this. I encourage those listening to this to take this as the only explanation for the album and the other videos on the subject as the only explanation for the album. Like there's no reason to want to go looking for this. Uh, this is just one of those morbid curiosities that I think will just have to stay a curiosity. That will bring us to the end of the disturbing music iceberg. If you've watched this far, thank you so much. This took a lot of work um, to make over almost like a month of work, almost a month and a half actually of work. It was, it was a ride. I, I will say researching this was crazy. And it's every time I research stuff like this, it's always like, like just a wild experience. Like doing the, the website iceberg or the disturbed media series. Uh, I always leave with like just crazy stories afterwards. So this one did not disappoint when it came to that. Let me know your thoughts on any of my, I guess my takes on the stuff. I feel like, I don't know. I feel like I am being a little harsh with some of my uh, interpretations, like with Peter Sotos and whatnot, but I just, I would love to hear everyone else's opinions on these things, which is why I'm even making the video in the first place. Also, if you haven't, uh, I have a Patreon and I will shamefully show that in right here. Um, right now it, it is a little bit harder. A lot of other YouTubers have been dealing with demonetization and limited ads and whatnot. Uh, the Patreon is only $3 for everything that I offer. That includes sneak peeks, uh, day early uploads, personal updates and whatnot with the channel, as well as exclusive week early access to merch when it drops. So if that interests you, go check that out. Um, I will also have uncensored explanations of videos going forward. Right now I only have like one on there of Disturbing Media Volume 3, but if you are into that and you like this video, and you like the way that I deliver the content, go check it out. Uh, I'm not saying everyone has to, but I think it's worth it for the low price tag. I think you get something if you do the most expensive tier. If you do tier three, you also will get your name at the end of the video, which is why you're seeing all these names on screen. So this is the patron shout out. Thank you to everyone that has joined. Honestly, thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, I, I was... <sighs> this month has been so crazy and I feel like having the Patreon to fall back on was definitely helpful. Um, it's also nice to be able to have a place to give my updates and just thank you to everyone who is on the Patreon right now. You are awesome. You are amazing. Just thank you. I, I really honestly wouldn't be able to be doing this if it wasn't for everyone that is helping on there. And just you watching, the, whoever's viewing this video. Thank you. 
the every single view helps um i put my heart and soul into this job and, and i really try my best to deliver on what i promise and i hope that i've been doing a great job um yeah i have nothing else to really say just thank you so much for watching um youtube has been awesome but yeah with all that said uh i will see you all in the next video thanks for watching